Later this week, Enoch Godongwana, the finance minister of South Africa, will present the national budget speech. Uh, this is yet another progress report from the government on a very difficult situation that it's in, helped out by the higher commodity prices. But what can we expect and what are the real challenges that are facing the finance minister? Stan Lib's chief economist, Kevin Lings, is our go-to man when it comes to things economics. And uh, Kevin is joining us now to give us some insight into the dilemmas. Hi, Kevin. It's quite a job to be the finance minister of South Africa at the moment. Hi, Alec. It's a terrible job, I think, because you've uh, got so many challenges you're trying to deal with in terms of economic constraints. And then at the same time, you've got a difficult political backdrop where you're going into a national election. And obviously, the party, the ANC, is under pressure. So there would be extra pressure on the Minister of Finance to try and alleviate all of these constraints. And he simply can't do it. So it's a balance in terms of where he can focus his attention. But I think ultimately he's going to reflect the fact that the fiscal position remains problematic. Is it likely that we'll see some politicking? Because usually if you're the ruling political party, sure you worry about the finances of the country, but your first priority is to actually get voted back into power. And uh, it'll be too late if you wait until next year. Absolutely. So it's very, very tempting to start to put some measures in place. Obviously, you can't be excessive about it. Well, I don't think you can be excessive about it, but um, there's certain areas where you could maybe increase spending. So the obvious is on social payments. They become enormous in South Africa, both in terms of the value and the number of people. So you could increase, and we are expecting to see an increase in how much money is allocated for all the different social grants, including the 350 rand social relief of distress grant. So those percentages likely to go up. And then you've got the question of government salaries. Now, the minister has been fairly successful in pegging back um, recent salary increases, but clearly unions are extremely unhappy and there's always this risk that we have a significant public sector strike. So one of the ways to certainly deal with that is to pencil in a, a more lenient salary adjustment. Again, you can't be excessive about it because the investor community would punish that, but there probably is some scope to increase it a little bit, and those would be seen as an element of populist uh, budgeting. As I say, I don't think he's likely to become outright populist by introducing other measures, particularly tax changes or any other significant developments around, say, NHI or land expropriation, any of those things I think are are not on the cards at this stage. But I think you'll see an element of politicking creep into the budget. The basic income grant, is that the 350 rand a month, which was started as COVID relief and now seems to be baked in? I think that's where it's going. The minister did say, to his credit last budget, he said, that he doesn't want to initiate a permanent increase in expenditure if it's not accompanied by a permanent increase in revenue, and that's 100% fair policy approach. And he's referring there to essentially the mining tax revenue, which has been extremely buoyant, but you don't want to initiate additional social payments using that revenue as the source because obviously that revenue may dissipate. But I think the reality is that we've now extended this uh, for the second time. Um, It's likely that the 350 will morph into some sort of income grant. I don't think it will be at the level that's been requested. We just simply can't afford that. But I do expect that it's going to become a, a permanent feature in time and then get a name change and maybe merge it with other social payments. And and clearly that is being looked at. It's going to end up being disappointing because you can't go with in excess of a thousand rand or whatever numbers being discussed. We just don't have the finances to afford that, but it's clear that it's not going away anytime soon. If I read you correctly, we've had this good fortune, this windfall that has come through from the commodity price boom. But on the other hand, that could be temporary and beware of using that to pay 
for something that you install a, a new cost, which would be permanent in a basic income grant or something along those lines. Yeah, all salary increases. So we've been bailed out by the commodity story, absolutely. And without that, gee, we would have been in a lot of turmoil in terms of fiscal constraints. So it's come at a very opportune time. And we've used it reasonably wisely. In other words, we initially, on the first year that we got this additional revenue, yes, government spent about half of it on various initiatives, and but the other half went to debt reduction, and, 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 and that's good. This year, another exceptional windfall. We'll have to see you know, how the minister is allocating that. But the risk now is that it starts to be seen as, oh, well, this is the base of revenue that we can now expect going forward, and we start to initiate additional expenditure. You can imagine the base for mining tax revenue now is exceptionally high. There would be some significant downside risk if commodity prices were to come off when the global economy goes into a more severe slowdown or some sort of recession. And and if we then committed all of that money into other ongoing projects, we would find ourselves going substantially further into debt. So it's something we've got to resist. But I can see the temptation because the tax revenue has held up. And we're looking at a number this year that is 80 to 90 billion above where government budgeted this time last year. Now that's that's substantial. That you know you set a budget and now you've got 80 or 90 billion more. What do you do with that money? There's no shortage of demand for that those funds, but are you creating ongoing expenditure that you've now committed to that you can't roll back? And if you go back to when Trevor Manuel was Minister of Finance, he kept saying once you start social payments, you can't reverse them. You've got to be careful about it. And that's exactly what's happened. They just keep building on. Same thing with, I would argue, with salaries. Very difficult for government to cut the number of people employed. So you're trying to peg back the salary increase, but you're now under under constraints from the union. So all of that is pressure this year going into an election year. I think government's going to give in to some of that pressure. And there's a risk. There's a risk that down the line, we find that that starts to hurt our fiscal balances and we find that we're back into the world of fiscal slippage. It's so interesting when you compare that with the other big issue at the moment, South Africa with 10 hours of power cuts per day in level six of load shedding. Is that not a greater priority perhaps when Treasury sits down and says, how are we going to be able to get this economy moving again if we don't have sufficient electricity and what can we do to use that 80 to 90 billion rand extra which we didn't expect we'd have to accelerate that yes if we could find a way to utilize that sort of those funds better and more directed and to actually show that that money's been spent on relieving one or two stages of of load shedding. Now, I'm thinking the minister will do something to encourage um, household solar panels, etc. But I suspect that that's not going to go far enough. I think that uh, the problem with it, say, a tax incentive is that the tax base in South Africa is very narrow. And a lot of those people who pay a lot of the tax are undertaking solar investments anyway. So I'm not sure that a tax incentive would give you the desired outcome. You would want to broaden it beyond that. But how do you do that? You could offer preferential finance to encourage people to install solar. But if you've got very little money, it doesn't matter how preferential the finance is. You just simply can't afford it. So I'm not sure that we're going to see a huge amount there. But you're right. That should be where where the focus is. And trying to put everything possible into alleviating that pressure as soon as possible and therefore get the economy going. Uh, this economy is trapped. It's, it's, it's stuck. It can't move forward in any real way because which business is under, going to undertake fixed investment, which business is going to employ while you've got this overarching electricity constraint. And that's going to eventually bite in terms of tax revenue. The Reserve Bank is forecasting 0.3% growth for this year. Well, tax revenue is going to be under enormous pressure 
under those circumstances unless somehow you get another windfall on the mining tax and that can't be the basis of how you're funding yourself. So alleviating that, getting some growth back in the economy is the best answer to addressing some of the social issues, be that unemployment, social grants, the size of government, salary costs, etc., Without economic growth, it's very, very difficult to move government finances into better shape. In other words, there's absolutely no substitute for economic growth. You can't find a workaround to deal with that on a long-term basis, and that has to be the priority. Kevin, what are the investment markets hoping for, and what are they expecting? I think what the market would hope for is a path towards further fiscal discipline and ultimately what we call a primary budget surplus, which is simply your total revenue minus your expenditure adjusting for the interest payments. And if that turned positive, that would be an unequivocal sign that you've been more disciplined. So you don't want a situation where government is simply spending money on consumption type items and the fiscal position is deteriorating. In addition, what you would want to see is an ongoing restructuring of government expenditure where they start to emphasize electricity and other infrastructure and they look at their expenditure program in terms of consumption expenditure and and find money, more efficiencies within that area and make some significant changes. So keep the total amount that you're spending under control but change the mix. And the mix has become overwhelmingly in favor of consumption. And we have used the budgets that we allocate for fixed investment infrastructure. We've increasingly used that to fund the consumption, salary grant, salary payments or social grants and other consumption expenditure. So their priority mix, that's what you would want to see. I don't think that's going to happen because that pressure on salaries, the pressure from social payments is significant. Now, do you want to use this time as you head into a national election to make that type of change? Probably unlikely. So the market, I think, would hope for something better than what it's going to get. And we think what it's going to get is something that does uh, additional social spending, talks about a restructuring of ESCOM, perhaps can go as far as to take on some of the ESCOM debt in tranches over a couple of years um, and overall allow for some fiscal slippage, but not enough that leads to further credit rating downgrades, etc. And I think over the next year or two, that's entirely feasible. But it's going to be, I think, clear when you look at the budget numbers that the, you're running out of road here, that if you if you can't get the electricity constraint lifted meaningfully and instill confidence and get private sector to engage and fixed investment and lift the growth, you're fighting a losing battle. And I think that's what the numbers are ultimately going, going to show you. And not long ago, we were on a really bad path in terms of fiscal deterioration. And when Tito took over as Minister of Finance, he did put in efforts to turn that around. But that required in order to continue that turnaround strategy, it absolutely required better economic growth, higher economic growth, more employment and a broadening of the tax base. And we simply been, haven't been able to follow through with that. We've been bailed out for two years by the commodity price story, thank goodness, but we can't rely on that as a long-term strategy. Is the, At what point do the politicians bite the bullet and do what's required to set South Africa on a better growth path, which is going to mean upsetting certain constituents within um, the ANC and within the broader uh, tripartite alliance and focus on getting the private sector involved, getting SOEs into better shape and lifting economic growth. But the reality of where we stand in the electoral process suggests it's more likely to be just kicking the can down the road. Yeah, I'm afraid so. I think that's what you end up with. I don't think you, this is going to be a year for significant um, structural change. I think the focus is going to be very much the restructuring of ESCOM and what does that mean. And for the rest, uh, it's going to be a holding pattern while giving in to some of the social pressures. 
Kevin, uh, the RAND, is it likely to react or have we seen in recent declining uh, of the currency or the decline of the currency now sitting at 18, <laughs> down from 14 Rand 50 to the US dollar only, well, last March, uh, that this is all being built in, that we are really in a corner and as you said earlier, thank heavens, there is some respite coming from commodity prices, but international investors are saying this is n it's going to need structural reform and those reforms aren't really coming through. That's right. So if you look at our performance relative to emerging markets or currencies, that's always a gauge as to whether or not we're getting our fair share. And, and no, our currency is on the whole weakening more than what's happened in emerging markets. And when you delve into that, that is undoubtedly own goals. In other words, we're hurting ourselves, not just because of the electricity outages that's been around for some time, but because we don't seem to have an urgent answer to that. We're not actively implementing and making changes and, and showing the path to a a better electricity environment. We we keep saying we're going to do the cabinet um, changes, but we haven't done that yet. We keep saying we're going to restructure Eskom, we haven't done that yet. So, the, so, and then we still got the threat of of grey listing on the twenty fourth of February and 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 further fiscal slippage. So we're not helping ourselves. And I think the the investor community has switched in terms of their interest in our bond market. At some point, a couple of years ago, they owned 42% of South African government bonds, domestic bonds. That's a huge amount. There was a commitment to South Africa. That number, as we've lost our credit ratings and we've slipped below investment grade, that number has dwindled to 25%. Now, 25% is, is significant holding, but it's not 42%. And in the course of running down that share of uh, government bonds, in foreign investors have become more speculative holders than long-term accumulators of government debt. So it's a change in the nature of how they look at South Africa. And so, yes, you could see foreign investment come in if the RAND's under pressure and it's perceived as being weaker and offering some value. And, and uh, we see, say, for example, inflation come down further and interest rates being cut, then, then money will come in. But it's probably likely to be short term and then exit at some point while when it's made some sort of gain. We're not in a position where we're building up systematically increased holdings of foreign inflows. In order to do that, we've got to present the world with a better longer term story. We don't have that. And so I think for the moment, the RAND is reflecting a lot of these concerns and, and it's, it's built in. So I don't think the budget, the way I'm envisaging is going to be a big surprise and therefore result in, in, in further RAND weakness, for example. But, and there is an opportunity because the currency is undervalued for some pullback uh, because it simply offers some value. But we're not at a point where we're going to get steady inflows that allows the RAND to regain a lot of the lost ground that's occurred over the last couple of years. You did mention Tito Mboweni. He always tended to pull some kind of a rabbit out of the hat. They didn't always work, but at least he had some ideas and some plans. I guess we can look for something. Is there any hope, Kevin, any hope in, in this very gloomy picture that we seem to face? No, I think I think Enoch's approach um, is is different in the sense of um, feeling that need to kind of inspire. I don't know that that's. I think it's more a steady approach. Um, I, I, I just don't see him coming up with something that's you know left field that suddenly inspires a whole lot of confidence. I think the critical things is going to be how do they manage the SOEs. How do they manage Eskom? Can he say anything around that 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 is more encouraging? That gives one a feeling that we are on a, a better path uh, with regards to Eskom. And and there's stuff that they can obviously do. And I'm hoping they've been working on stuff in the background that they could maybe table that would 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 suggest um, more progress has been made than we are aware of. That would certainly be encouraging. And then obviously anything that suggests that government is, can meaningfully switch some of their expenditure into infrastructure more broadly because I know we focused on electricity, but you know, we really worry that the water, sanitation, those infrastructures, the rail, the port, 
are also failing and they're also under substantial pressure. And any of that sort of switching expenditure would be very welcome because it then reinvigorates construction activities, some manufacturing, some job creation, and it can be the kickstarter to better economic growth. So those are the areas that I'm hoping. You can't really... You can't really, for example, announce a substantial reduction in tax rates, cut individual or corporates or anything like that. He needs the tax revenue and he's probably just not in a position to inspire a, a more positive feel. And and anyway, the, the Reserve Bank would be bitterly unhappy if he did that because they've got this fight against inflation and they, they feel they need to keep rates high to get inflation under control. So he's got to be mindful of that. And the best way to deal with it is infrastructure. It's, it's less inflationary. It's better for growth. It it's, um, uses domestic raw materials and domestic supplied goods. Uh, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. But we just failed to be able to implement it. You did mention the grey listing to close off with on the 24th of February. That's this week. Uh, what, are the, That's right. what is it looking like? Well, so initially the thought was there's an 80% chance of us being grey listed. Then government did push back to their credit. They did lobby the G some of the G20 members. They did enact some some changes, and they are in the process of trying to implement reforms. and And it felt that it was a a closer call. But the most sort of recent communication suggests, on balance, we probably do get grey listed. And then uh, hopefully we continue on with various reforms so that the time we spend in the grey list zone, if you like, is 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 kept as short as possible and that we, we move out of that. So I think that's probably the, the most likely outcome. I think it would be very fortuitous if we if we can avoid it entirely. I'm just not sure that we've done enough. We have done some, but I'm not sure that we we we've done enough to ensure that we're not grey listed. So the best case scenario would be no grey listing, but that's a very small chance. The second best uh, case scenario is continuation of the things to make sure that uh, we get out of grey or South Africa gets out of grey listing as soon as possible. Kevin Lings is the Chief Economist at Stanlib. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.